Today on Brief History, we discuss an acknowledged yet uncrowned King of England. Becoming King at a young age, his short time in that role would be dominated by political strife and factional struggles. His unknown fate, mixed with the accusations surrounding his life and assumed death, would ultimately lead to debate centuries later. Join me as I take a brief look at the Prince in the Tower, remembered today as Edward V of England. Edward was born on November 2, 1470, at the house of the Abbot of Westminster, which was adjoined to Westminster Abbey. He was the son of King Edward IV of England, and his mother was Elizabeth Woodville. Edward was the fourth child of ten children between his parents, and of the ten children, seven would outlive their father, King Edward IV. Edward was the eldest male child, thus making him heir to his father's throne and his younger brother Richard would inherit the title Duke of York upon their father's death as Edward would become king at that time. Edward's brother Richard is often also referred to as Richard of Shrewsbury after the town which he was born and will be referred to as both the Duke of York and Richard of Shrewsbury throughout Edward's story. Edward's birth took place in Westminster due to the political events that had taken place just prior to his birth. His father, Edward IV, had taken the throne from the prior king, Henry VI of England, and had ruled for approximately eight years before factional disagreements between his own supporters caused him to flee to the continent, to which Henry VI was then released from imprisonment and restored to his kingship. This event was part of a bloody civil conflict known today as the Wars of the Roses, fought between King Henry VI's House of Lancaster and Edward's family's House of York. Edward's father and grandfather played a major role in this conflict, and due to his father's deposition and flight into exile, Edward's mother, heavily pregnant with Edward at the time, sought sanctuary at Westminster Abbey as the regime change took place. However, Edward's father was a brilliant warrior, and soon gathered enough support to return to England and contest those who had removed him from power. He was ultimately successful in this, and after six months being away from his family, Edward's father finally was able to retake London and reunite with Edward, his mother, and his sisters. Shortly after Edward's birth and his father's retaking of the throne, Edward was designated as Prince of Wales in 1471. Around two years of age, Edward's father appointed a long list of tutors and counselors to tend to him until he was to reach the age of 14 years old. By the age of three in 1473, he had been sent to Ludlow Castle in the Welsh marches to begin his virtuous, cunning, and knightly upbringing. His maternal uncle, Anthony Woodville, Earl Rivers, was designated as Edward's guardian. Edward's uncle lived with him at Ludlow after 1473, and instructions provided by Edward's father included Edward early in his life, partaking in regular religious observance. He was also to be read many noble stories as he grew. There is speculation that as he grew, Edward was regarded by his family as a sickly, even depressed child, something that will be touched on later in this story. Although this may have been the case, he was also said to have been polite, educated, remarkably gifted, and wise beyond his years. It was also said that Edward was very much his mother's child and was obviously fully under her and her Woodville faction's influence. This is a major factor that will be discussed in more detail later in Edward's story. Edward's upbringing seemed to be in line with what would be expected of a young royal child, but as we will soon see, even through the lens of a royal prince, his life would be anything but normal. Edward V's time as king is significantly different than many other kings of England. The mystery, scandal, and overall dispute in relation to the facts, if you can call them that, make discussing Edward's story in an objective manner extremely difficult. Therefore, the following discussion will be broken into three accounts of the same story. The first one will be an attempted objective account to briefly relay some of the background related to Edward's story and to give a high-level view of the events that happened through current day. 
The next two accounts will be from one of two perspectives. The first being the Richard III is guilty perspective, and the second being Richard III is innocent slash unfairly treated perspective. This is by no means meant to be an all-encompassing account of all the information that's out there. One must understand that any discussion related to what may have happened to Edward and his brother, or why, should always be approached with a degree of skepticism and questioning. This topic is still hotly disputed to this day, and a clear picture has yet to be revealed in regards to the mystery surrounding Edward and his brother. With that being said, let us continue to our attempted objective account. Edward's father is remembered today as a great warrior, as touched on previously, brave and tenacious in war. His aggressive and relentless nature led to many great victories during the Wars of the Roses, which included battles that took place at Mortimer's Cross, Towton, Barnet, and Tewkesbury. But Edward's father is also remembered for some less glamorous personality traits, which would lead to many issues after his death. He was said to have greatly enjoyed leisure, entertainment, and excess, and was said to have lived a quite promiscuous lifestyle. This is not particularly out of line with how some other kings or members of the nobility may have lived in that time, but it was specifically the way that he allegedly went about this that would cause issues. The marriage of Edward's parents was actually quite scandalous, as Edward's mother was of significantly lower birth than what would have been expected of a queen. In fact, Edward's parents had been married in private, unbeknown to many throughout the realm. It is said that Edward's father wished his mother initially to become his mistress, but his mother refused, allegedly going as far as defending her honor with a dagger. But being ever persistent, Edward's father offered marriage to his mother, which as stated previously was accepted and took place in private. But this, allegedly, was not the first time Edward's father had acted in such a way, and as we will soon see, this would be the basis for future problems for young Edward. Edward's father was said to have died on April 9th, 1483, and with that an interesting set of events would play out. Edward's mother and her family, the Woodvilles, had gained great favor with Edward's father during his reign, and essentially had become their own faction, with many disproving and disliking the queen and her family. Upon Edward's father's death, his mother sent to her brother, Edward's guardian, Anthony Woodville, to bring Edward to London as soon as possible. Her younger son, Edward's younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, discussed previously, was with her in London at the time. It is alleged, however, that she did not send word to her brother-in-law, the younger brother of her late husband. His name was Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and he was Edward's paternal uncle. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, had gained a great deal of power during Edward's father's reign, proving himself on the field of battle and ultimately becoming an extremely powerful man in the north. Edward's father's favoritism towards Edward's mother and her family had caused Richard to withdraw from court, and the failure to reconcile these two factions would be the basis for the coming events. Edward, himself at Ludlow, would have learned of his father's death on April 14th, but did not leave Ludlow immediately. Instead, he remained in Ludlow for nine days to celebrate the Feast of St. George on April 23rd and set out one day later, April 24th, to head to London with his uncle and guardian, Anthony Woodville. Although Edward's other uncle, Richard Duke of Gloucester, apparently did not receive word of the king's death from Edward's mother, he did receive word of the news around April 20th prior to Edward's departure from Ludlow. It is believed that he was notified by a man named William Hastings, known as Lord Hastings, who was Edward's father's chamberlain. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, sent word that he wished to meet up with Edward and his other uncle, Anthony Woodville, on their way to London and set the meeting point at Northampton. Richard, being in the north at the time, set off for York, then subsequently to Northampton to meet up with Edward and his entourage. At Northampton, he met up with his cousin, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, and also rendezvoused with Anthony Woodville. But he soon found that Anthony Woodville did not have Edward with him. In fact, Edward had traveled on to Stony Stratford, not far from Northampton. Richard learned of this, arrested Anthony Woodville along with others before heading to Stony Stratford. He found Edward and took control of him and his royal party. They traveled back to Northampton before heading to London to plan for Edward's coronation. Edward's uncle, Anthony Woodville, would eventually be executed along with one of Edward's half-siblings. Elizabeth Woodville, upon hearing news that Edward was now in the custody of Richard, Duke of Gloucester, 
fled back to sanctuary at Westminster Abbey with Edward's younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, now Duke of York, along with Edward's sisters. On Sunday, May 4th, initially the planned date for his coronation, Edward and his uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, entered London, where Edward was taken to the Bishop of London's palace next to St. Paul's Cathedral. Edward stayed at the Bishop of London's palace for a few days before eventually being moved to the royal apartments at the Tower of London. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was formally appointed as Lord Protector, and writs were issued summoning members to what was intended to be the first parliament of Edward's reign. Preparations were also being made for Edward's coronation, which had been rescheduled for June 24, 1483. However, things abruptly changed in early June when a clergyman addressed the royal council. This man had served Henry VI prior to his deposition and execution by Edward's father, and then subsequently had served Edward's father faithfully and dutifully. He had been trusted and promoted by Edward's father, and was eventually appointed as Keeper of the Privy Seal. His name was Robert Stillington, Bishop of Bath and Wells, and the information he allegedly relayed to the council would change the course of English history. Bishop Stillington was alleged to have stated that Edward could not be crowned as King of England because he was not a legitimate child of Edward IV. This was, as he claimed, due to the fact that he had allegedly performed a marriage between Edward's father and a woman named Eleanor Butler, which took place prior to Edward's parents being married. Although Eleanor Butler had by that time died, she was still alive when Edward's parents were married, and this of course would mean that Edward's father's marriage to his mother was bigamy, and that Edward himself, along with all of his siblings, were illegitimate. There is speculation that this may not have been the first time that Bishop Stillington had raised the issue. In fact, Stillington had been imprisoned by Edward's father for a time in relation to the trial and execution of Edward's ambitious uncle, George, Duke of Clarence. George was the younger brother of Edward's father, but an elder brother of Richard, Duke of Gloucester. It has been put forward that perhaps Stillington relayed this information to George, Duke of Clarence, which ended up being the catalyst to his imprisonment and also the catalyst to George, Duke of Clarence's execution. However, this has never been confirmed. After a pardon and release, Stillington apparently chose to keep quiet until Edward's father had died, and now, in 1483, chose to, in his mind, do the right thing and reveal the truth. This type of information would usually have been brought forth to a parliament, but parliament had not yet opened. An unofficial assembly was formed to decide the issue. Bishop Stillington's information was relayed to this group, and a decision was reached that Edward and his siblings were indeed illegitimate, and thus had no right to the throne. George, Duke of Clarence, discussed previously, was a younger brother to Edward's father, as stated previously, and an elder brother to Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and therefore, in theory, his lineage would have had a better claim to the throne over Richard, Duke of Gloucester. However, an act of attainder had been utilized against George, Duke of Clarence, which excluded his children from the throne of England, and therefore, Richard, Duke of Gloucester was seen as the next in line to the throne. It should be noted that attainder was reversible, and multiple kings had ascended to the throne after being attained, including Edward's father. Not everyone agreed with the decision put forth by the assembly. Some openly and vehemently opposed Richard, Duke of Gloucester, becoming king. One of those opposed to the deposition of Edward was Lord Hastings, discussed previously, who had sent word to Richard, Duke of Gloucester, that Edward's father had died. Therefore, two factions arose, which now began to meet separately. At one point, those opposed to the deposition of Edward met at the Tower of London, and during this meeting, a scuffle broke out to which Lord Hastings was slain, and others opposed to the deposition were arrested. Therefore, in the end, opposition collapsed, young Edward was set aside as a bastard king, and the throne was formally offered to Richard, Duke of Gloucester, to which he accepted. He would become known to history as King Richard III of England. A delegation was sent to Elizabeth Woodville to attempt to convince her to release her young son, Edward's younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, from sanctuary to be taken to join Edward at the Tower of London. She was convinced to do so, and that day, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, left Westminster Abbey and was transported to the Tower of London to stay with his brother, Edward. Sermons began to be given out publicly to raise the issue of Edward's illegitimacy to the public, and Richard, Duke of Gloucester, was crowned on July 6, 1483. 
Unfortunately, at this point, there is little more that can be specifically stated in regards to Edward in an objective manner, other than that Edward and his brother simply disappeared. It is claimed that they began to be seen less and less at the tower before eventually they were never seen again. However, before we get into opinions on the matter, we must also understand the events that followed Edward's disappearance, as they are crucial in attempting to understand what may have happened. A couple weeks after Richard's coronation, he set out on a tour of the realm with his cousin and supporter, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, who had by that point been treated very generously by Richard. In August, Buckingham left Richard, and Richard continued on to York. In September, Richard received news that a rebellion was forming in the South, known today as Buckingham's Rebellion. As the name implies, this rebellion included Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, who had been convinced to switch sides and began to oppose Richard. This is also the time that a man named Henry Tudor began to push his claim to the throne. Richard was a king from the House of York, which was, as discussed previously, one of the houses that fought in the Wars of the Roses. Their opponents had been the Lancastrians, who were led by the feeble-minded King Henry VI, who had been deposed and executed by Edward's father, also discussed previously. The Lancastrians' heraldic badge was the Red Rose, while Edward's House of York's heraldic badge was the White Rose, hence the name Wars of the Roses. During this Wars of the Roses, the Lancastrian male line had become nearly extinct, with the execution of Henry VI and the death of his son Edward of Westminster at the Battle of Tewkesbury. However, there was a man through the Lancastrian bloodline that still had a claim to the throne, albeit an extremely shaky one. This, of course, was Henry Tudor, and he had fled into exile after Edward's father's victories discussed previously. Henry Tudor's grandmother was Henry VI's mother, Catherine of Valois, who had married a Welshman named Owen Tudor after her first husband, the famous King Henry V, had died. She went on to have a son named Edmund Tudor, who married a girl named Margaret Beaufort, and they were the parents to Henry Tudor. Margaret Beaufort was a descendant of the Lancastrian John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, through his line of illegitimate children known as the Beauforts, who had been legitimized during a previous reign. John of Gaunt was the father of King Henry IV, grandfather to King Henry V, and great-grandfather to the deposed and executed King Henry VI. By the time Richard III had seized control from Edward, Henry Tudor was around 26 years old and a fully capable individual. Although Henry Tudor and Buckingham had sided with one another, the rebellion was quickly handled, with Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, being captured and executed at Salisbury, and Henry Tudor fleeing back into exile in Brittany. It should also be noted that in 1484, a statute was ratified in Parliament known as Titulus Regius, which essentially declared that Edward and his siblings were illegitimate and reinforced Richard's right to the throne. Eventually, however, Henry Tudor would gather enough support to re-establish himself enough to make a push for the throne. He landed and met Richard at the Battle of Bosworth Field, to where Richard's forces were defeated and Richard himself was slain. Henry Tudor became Henry VII of England, and thus began the Tudor dynasty. Henry immediately repealed the act of parliament that made Edward and his siblings illegitimate, and married Edward's eldest sister, Elizabeth of York. During Henry Tudor's time as king, stories of what happened to Edward and his younger brother began to form in the open. Multiple pretenders would arise during Henry Tudor's time as king, one of which claimed to be Edward's younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York. In the 17th century, bones of two children, matching the approximate age of Edward and his brother, were discovered at the Tower of London. These were assumed to be the remains of Edward and his brother, and the remains were interred at Westminster in an urn, where they remain to this day. The information that has just been relayed is an attempt at a straightforward, high-level, objective account of the events that led up to Edward's disappearance, as well as the events that followed. But this is far from the end of the discussion in relation to Edward. The very difficult questions remain. What happened to Edward and his brother? And if something nefarious befell the young boys, who ultimately bears the responsibility? There are many contemporary or slightly later than contemporary sources that discuss the events leading up to and following the disappearance of Edward and his brother. 
We will not attempt to name or discuss all of them here, nor will we get too far into the weeds in discussing the ones we do talk about. But two of them require mentioning, as they will be used as the basis for much of the anti-Richard argument or story. The first source was written by a man named Dominic Mancini, who was an Italian monk who had gone to England in late 1482. He was to report back to his archbishop on the affairs in England. He left England the week after Richard III's coronation. Those hostile to Richard III claim that Mancini was an objective source who was in no way coerced in his writings, nor, they believe, did he have any reason to be hostile towards Richard. They claim he was a man of integrity who relayed straight-up facts, using that word lightly, and did not try to underpin an undertone of morality to the story as many writers did in that day. His account was lost for centuries, and therefore it is believed that no subsequent sources had access to or saw his writings. However, it is claimed that his account corroborates many other accounts from that time, giving credence to much of its contents. The second source is that of Sir Thomas More, a statesman and author writing in the early 16th century under the Tudors. His account is certainly believed to be embellished at times, but those hostile to Richard III argue that much of the source material is authentic. They also argue that his accounts are verified by other sources here and there, some of which could not have been known to More at the time of his writing. More is described as a man of integrity, and those hostile to Richard III claim that he was not simply a propagandist for the Tudors. In fact, he actually went as far as opposing them at times and was executed by one of them. There are certainly criticisms of these two sources, and they will be discussed at a later time. For centuries, Edward's uncle, Richard III, has taken much of the blame for his nephew's disappearance. So what are some of the arguments that might lead one to this conclusion? To start, it is important to note that many critical to Richard III fully acknowledge his accomplishments prior to 1483. The time in which he lived was a brutal one, and Richard was not only a successful warrior, winning glory and honor at the Battle of Barnet and Tewkesbury, but also an able man, hardworking and conscientious, despite his potential physical limitations because of his scoliosis. After the death of King Edward IV, however, some believe Richard took his ruthlessness to another level. It is accepted that Edward's father had adjusted his will to designate Richard, his younger brother, as protector over Edward, and some believe that this was done due to the unpopularity of the Woodvilles. However, the Woodvilles were already entrenched and intended to remain at the top. It was their intention to ignore Edward's father's will and to use Edward himself as a puppet. However, as stated previously, there were those on the council opposed to the Woodvilles, specifically Lord Hastings discussed previously. The Woodvilles looked for any way to prevent Richard from attaining his protectorate and realized that the office of protector was an interim one. Based on precedent, once the king was crowned, this position would lapse, and with Edward 12 years old at the time, there was no reason why he couldn't be crowned right away. If this was to take place, Richard would be powerless, and the power would revert to the Woodville-dominated council. This is believed to be the reason why Edward's mother withheld notifying Richard in the north. Of course, as we have stated previously, this plan was thwarted by the hostile Lord Hastings, who notified Richard of the events taking place. Richard was no fool, and immediately realized what the Woodvilles were up to. Although later evidence will be presented that will be quite damning for Richard, many agree that Richard really had no option but to attempt to seize power. If he did not, the low-born and hostile Woodvilles would end up gaining control of young Edward, at which point they would regain almost full control of the government. If that were the case, Richard's power in the north would certainly have been at risk. It is also claimed that although Richard did not stand up for his executed brother George Duke of Clarence, as he stood to gain greatly from his fall, he nevertheless held animosity towards Queen Elizabeth Woodville for her part in his downfall and execution, to which it is believed that she played a major role. With this in mind, perhaps there is at least a degree of understanding that can be reached in regards to Richard's mindset. To him, everything was at stake, and drastic steps would be needed to secure himself and his future. This would ultimately result in the coup, to quote those hostile to Richard, that would take place. Richard kept in communication with many, including Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, who had a history of disdain for the Woodvilles. In fact, Buckingham was actually married to Queen Elizabeth Woodville's sister, Catherine Woodville, and was not happy about it. 
It is believed that Buckingham saw in Richard an opportunity to have the wrongs done to him in the past righted. The Woodvilles, for their part, were just as fearful of what would happen to them should Richard seize power, and the power struggle that would ensue was most likely inevitable. Anthony Woodville obviously expected nothing when Richard indicated that he would meet them at Northampton on their way to London after King Edward IV's death. Actually, Woodville was said to have gone out of his way to accommodate Richard in order to establish good relations with him. It is true that Anthony Woodville was loyal to his sister and family, but he was also well respected by those in the realm, being brave, chivalrous, well-educated, a respected jouster, and a man of honor. However, it is said that after lulling Woodville into a sense of ease with his initial friendly nature, Richard's coup commenced. He had Woodville arrested the following morning under the charge of influencing Edward against him and having attempted to remove Edward from the guardianship of the Protector, which he was not at that time. As stated previously, he was to be sent north and eventually executed. According to those hostile to Richard, this was illegal, as Richard at that point had not been designated or confirmed as protector by the council. Richard and Buckingham then rushed to Stony Stratford to find Edward. Although they were said to have shown him proper respect once they arrived, they accused those around Edward of laying traps and conspiring to kill them. It is believed that Edward exhibited some resistance, but it was in vain. Most of those escorting Edward were arrested or ordered to withdraw, and with that, Richard had officially seized the majority of control. Once the Woodvilles learned of the coup, they were unsurprisingly horrified. They attempted to gather support, but their unpopularity prevented them from being able to do so. Only after Queen Elizabeth realized that many were in favor of Richard becoming protector did she flee to Westminster with her children. Richard began spreading propaganda against the Woodvilles in order to gain public support, and once arriving in London, young Edward did not partake in the council meetings. Anti-Richard proponents claim that although discussions were had in relation to who would yield control in Edward's minority at this time, this was simply a formality, as it was clear that Richard was already in control. After Richard was formally made protector, it has been argued that Richard's bid to seize the throne fully commenced. Although he had a degree of power as protector, Richard knew that the council had many Woodville supporters on it, and if Edward's planned coronation within a month took place, he would lose this power and simply be made a figurehead of a council dominated by his opponents. Not to mention, Edward would soon reach his majority, and with the events that took place at Stony Stratford and the influence that had already been made by the Woodvilles on Edward, Richard surely realized that he had most likely alienated the young king, and that Edward would fall back under his mother and her family's influence when this time came. This, many claim, was not acceptable to Richard, and that he was by that time fully committed to taking the throne from Edward. Richard attempted to secure the executions of those seized at Northampton and Stony Stratford, including Anthony Woodville, who had at that time not yet been executed. But he encountered his first resistance from the council at this time, as it has been argued that no one thought that those arrested at Northampton or Stony Stratford were guilty. Councillors also expressed distaste for the failure to provide for Queen Elizabeth Woodville. Richard responded by appointing a committee to negotiate with the Queen to attempt to get her and her children to withdraw from sanctuary. This attempt ended in absolute failure, as the Queen abjectly refused to exit, and it is believed that Richard continued to sow the seeds of hatred towards the Queen at this time. Richard then illegally seized the estates of some of the Woodville family, including Anthony Woodville, and distributed them to his supporters as if they had been forfeited through an act of attainder, which they had not been. Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, was one who had received great rewards from Richard, which included many great titles and lands, although this would come later. Writs were issued summoning the peers of the realm for the first parliament of Edward's reign after his coronation. Richard was also requesting that his protectorate be extended past the coronation all the way up to Edward's majority. It is said that the council stated that this should be referred to Parliament after the coronation, but Richard could not risk that, as if this suggestion failed in Parliament, it would be significantly more difficult to oppose an anointed and crowned Edward. It has been argued that by that time, many were becoming fearful of Richard and were concerned of Richard's true intentions. 
Richard, sensing this opposition, is said to have been the one responsible for splitting the council into two groups discussed previously, one which included the supporters of his influence after the coronation and the other comprised of those opposed to it. Those opposed to this obviously included Lord Hastings, who, as discussed previously, had been the one to notify Richard of Edward's father's death in the first place. Time was running out for Richard, and he needed to make his move. He therefore made one of his prime motives to secure Edward's brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, who was at Westminster with their mother and sisters, due to the fact that if any attempt was made against Edward, his younger brother could become a problem as well. This will be discussed in more detail shortly. It is also argued that at this time, prior to June 9th, that Richard put out feelers to Lord Hastings to see if he would accept that Richard was the rightful king. Hastings was obviously opposed to this, and Richard then, knowing that Hastings was a serious threat, began to act as if Hastings and the counselors opposed to his further protectorate were conspiring against him. Richard summoned troops from the north and unlawfully sent letters for the execution of Anthony Woodville and others, as this was an absolute necessity for him. Many have argued that this order is again another example of proof that Richard now cared little of what Edward thought and had already committed himself to becoming king, as killing the uncle of a king, much less the king's former guardian, would have been an extremely foolish thing to do, and this would have most likely seriously angered Edward. Then Richard finally made his move against Hastings. It is said that Richard summoned a council meeting in the innermost quarters of the White Tower. There he accused Hastings and others of plotting against his life and then suddenly cried out that an ambush had been sent for him. A shout of treason rang out and armed soldiers stormed in and seized Hastings and others violently. Hastings was executed shortly after his arrest without judgment. Hastings, as a peer of the realm, should have been tried by Parliament, but many say that because Hastings knew too much of Richard's coup plans, he had to be dealt with immediately. It should be noted that Bishop Stillington's revelation about Edward's illegitimacy was said to have taken place as stated previously in early June, but it has been argued that Richard initially had intended to declare Edward's father illegitimate, but subsequently dropped this claim as this would have offended his own mother, who would have had to have been accused of adultery. Some argue that this is what brought on the claims of Stillington, which are argued to have been invented by Richard. Many point to the fact that the timing of Stillington's revelation is damning in itself, and that it came at a too perfect time for Richard. Some have argued that Stillington's encounter with the council very well may have never even taken place, and that it is suspect that neither Stillington nor Eleanor Butler would have raised the issue when Edward's father and mother were married. Some have claimed that Stillington may have held a grudge for his imprisonment by Edward's father discussed previously, and was now taking his vengeance. Additionally, it is said that this should have been brought before a church court in order to determine the validity, but this was not done, and this some say is evidence that Richard had no proof of the matter and his position was weak. Others have argued further that if this accusation was true, Edward's father would have never released Stillington from prison. Whatever the case, Stillington's revelation was plausible due to Edward's father's promiscuous reputation and also due to his actions in regards to marrying Elizabeth Woodville. Stillington's story would be the basis for Richard's usurpation as discussed previously, and his meeting with the council was said to have taken place prior to Hastings' execution. All of Edward's attendants in the tower were allegedly denied access to Edward after Hastings' execution, isolating him even further. Edward's physician, John Argentine, who tended to Edward regularly at this time, was alleged to have said that Edward was doing daily confessions and believed that he was close to death. Those hostile to Richard interpret this as Edward believing that he was close to execution. Richard also moved on Queen Elizabeth Woodville around this time. The council, without Hastings' opposition and allegedly in fear, agreed that it would be improper if Edward's brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, was not at the coronation. Richard had the sanctuary surrounded by troops. The Queen was persuaded to release her son Richard of Shrewsbury, but it has been argued that she did this out of fear, as the Yorkists had already shown that they were not above breaking the sanctity of sanctuary, and if she did not comply, Richard would have simply taken the group by force. It is also believed that she trusted the words of the Archbishop of Canterbury that her son would not be harmed. 
It was claimed that it was at this time that Edward and his brother were removed from the royal apartments and moved to the inner apartments of the tower, to where they began to be seen less and less. They were initially seen behind bars and windows, and were allowed to exercise outdoors. But soon they not only ceased to appear outdoors, but also ceased to appear behind the windows. Tradition states that they were held in what was known at the time as the Garden Tower, now named the Bloody Tower, but this claim has its fair share of doubters. Richard was now in an all-or-nothing position, as many on the council began to lose trust in him, and Edward and the Woodvilles would obviously remain always as opposition to him. Although it is claimed he had lost popularity and trust due to his treatment of Hastings and because of his other questionable actions, Richard was still in a very powerful position. He canceled the parliament, set for the beginning of Edward's reign, and postponed the coronation indefinitely. The sermons were preached, declaring Richard's right to the throne to the public, to which it has been argued that this did not go over well with the public. Some of the barons had arrived for Edward's now postponed coronation and were assembled. A petition was alleged to have been drafted by Richard and his allies, but in the name of the assembly, which requested that he take the throne. The assembly allegedly approved this because there was a great deal of fear that had been instilled in them. This fear was due to Hastings' execution, Richard's alliance with other powerful men, including Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, and the troops that these two men had called to the capital. This assembly, however, it has been argued did not have the power to declare Edward and his siblings illegitimate, and that Edward was not actually disinherited until the Act of 1484 was passed. Therefore, Edward's deposition has been argued to have been illegal. Richard retired to his mother's castle, and the petition was presented to him, allegedly in order to eliminate the dangers of a minority and disputed kingship. Richard was said to have reluctantly agreed to take the crown, but as one could by this point imagine, those critical to Richard see this as little more than an attempt to propagandize the situation. Richard is said by many to have been unpopular after he seized power, not only due to the way in which he seized control, but also due to the fact that he was seen as more of a northerner. He now knew that he must find a way to win over his subjects. Richard was crowned on July 6th, 1483, and after that, set out on a progress through the realm. Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, accompanied Richard initially, and had by that point started receiving his generous rewards. On his tour, Richard allegedly received alarming news that a plot or plots had been hatched to attempt to secure Edward and his brother and or his sister's release. This, argues those hostile towards Richard, sealed Edward's fate as Richard realized that his throne would not be safe if Edward and his brother lived. It has been alleged that Richard sent word to the constable of the tower that Edward and his brother were to be put to death. Although the constable was loyal to Richard and was steadfast in his defense and safety of the tower, he refused the deed. This is around the time that Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, departed Richard, and many believe that he did so after learning of Richard's plans to do away with the young boys, although he gave no indication of his change of heart to Richard at the time of his departure. Richard, after learning of the constable of the tower's denial, allegedly commissioned for the task a man named Sir James Tyrrell, a man loyal to him who had served him over ten years and who was looking to move up in the world at any cost. Meanwhile, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, after leaving Richard, was said to have met up with Margaret Beaufort, the mother of the exiled Henry Tudor, and began plotting against Richard. Some have claimed that Buckingham was a Lancastrian at heart, and although he may have initially considered making a bid for the throne himself at this point, after abandoning Richard, along with any potential future worldly benefit, he was eventually convinced to support Henry Tudor's claim. Thus, the beginnings of Buckingham's rebellion began, which, as discussed previously, would be crushed. Sir James Tyrrell was allegedly sent to the tower by Richard around mid-August with orders that the constable hand over the tower for one night. This was done, and it is alleged that although Tyrrell didn't take part in the murder, the boys were killed sometime in early September. It has been argued that those physically responsible were two men named Miles Forrest and John Dighton. There are multiple different accounts on how people believe the boys were killed, and these accounts span from being smothered with their feather bed and pillows, to being put to the sword, to being drowned in wine, to being starved to death. 
Sir Thomas More's disputed account relays that the boys were then buried deep underground at the foot of stairs, but that later the bodies were removed by a lone priest and moved to an unknown location. The bodies of the young boys that were discovered in the 17th century were found at the base of a staircase of the White Tower, and this is on par with what Sir Thomas More wrote. Other accounts claim that they were put into a chest and thrown into the sea. Sir James Tyrrell would gain substantially after this, being appointed to many lucrative offices that gained him great wealth. Those hostile towards Richard claim that Richard was surely responsible for the boys' deaths, and they claim that this is evidenced by the fact that his reputation was continually damaged by allegations of his involvement, and despite this, Richard made no attempt to produce the boys or refer to their existence, even when Henry Tudor began to push his claim and use these allegations to his benefit. Although some may claim that Richard had no reason to fear his nephews, the Wars of the Roses had already shown that nobles with enough power could restore or elevate claimants to the throne if they stood to gain from it. Previous deposed monarchs did not have a good track record either, as all the previous deposed monarchs, Edward II, Richard II, and Henry VI, all met their deaths shortly after being finally deposed, and it can be argued that each were murdered. Because in this case, those being murdered were children and Richard's own blood relation, it is argued that this is the reason that it was done in secrecy, and it was hoped that his reputation would not be affected. Of course, this was not the case. Many pro-Richard proponents argued that his reputation was simply blackened by Henry VII after he seized the throne, but those hostile him argue that his reputation was already poor during his time as king, and that many during his time believed that he was guilty. The only reason that more writings came up during the Tudor's reign was because writers now had the freedom to publicly express their views about Richard without fear of repercussion. Nevertheless, Richard would meet a brutal end at Bosworth Field, and with Henry Tudor's usurpation, so begins much of the argument of Richard's innocence in the matter. Today, despite centuries of hatred that has been directed towards Richard III and the unfavorable reputation that he has attained, there are many that reject the idea that Richard was a twisted and evil man, guilty of the deaths of his nephews, and have set out to alter his reputation and prove his innocence. Many of these individuals are known today as Ricardians, and although what we are to discuss shortly may be in line with Ricardian beliefs, this should not be considered an all-encompassing account of their stance in relation to Richard III. It is suggested that if anyone is interested in Ricardian ideology, that they conduct independent research separate from this attempted summary. So, generally speaking, what are some of the arguments of those who believe that Richard III was innocent of murdering his nephews? To start, we must refer back to the two sources touched on previously. Dominic Mancini, along with many other sources in that time, had proven errors in his writings, and therefore, it has been argued that his second-hand information should be taken with caution. Also, it has been argued that he spoke little English, and that many interpretations of his writing have been incorrect or biased. Mancini also could be seen as having simply repeated unsubstantiated rumors as he was receiving his information secondhand. The second source discussed previously, Sir Thomas More, has been labeled simply as a propagandist for the Tudor regime, as his writings were written after the fact, as stated previously. More was only five years old in 1483 when the princes disappeared, and therefore, many have been critical of his writings, stating that they are little more than gossip and hearsay. Nevertheless, all the sources, including the two discussed, remain disputed between the two sides of the argument. Getting back to the pro-Richard subject matter, it has been argued that the name Princes in the Tower relays the wrong message and is propaganda in itself. First, this title implies that the Tower of London was strictly a prison, which was not strictly the case in Edward's time. Throughout the Middle Ages, the Tower of London had been used as a royal residence as well as a prison. Therefore, the assumption that because Edward and his brother were in the Tower, they should be considered as imprisoned may not be correct. Also, the term princes in itself carries with it an assumption of royal right. As we have seen, after Bishop Stillington's revelation, Edward and Richard were considered illegitimate and could no longer be considered princes. 
It is argued that this belief was shared not just by Richard, but by Parliament and many others as well. We will touch on the legitimacy issue again shortly, but the point here is that some believe that the phrase princes in the tower could be misleading. Richard III is oftentimes accused of staging a coup against Edward, which was said to have began around the time when he arrested members of Edward's entourage at Northampton and secured Edward at Stony Stratford. However, it is believed that Edward's mother intended to crown young Edward, 12 years old at the time, less than a month after the announcement of her husband's death, as discussed previously, and therefore hoped to ensure that she and her Woodville family would take control politically, essentially taking on the role of regent. This would have been an odd situation, as precedent in relation to minority kings would have suggested that Richard Duke of Gloucester would become regent or protector, not the Woodvilles. It has been argued that Richard would have been the rightful individual to be protecting young Edward based on the precedents that had existed previously. The most recent example at the time would have been King Henry VI, who came to the throne as an infant. His paternal uncles, brothers to his father Henry V, John Duke of Bedford and Humphrey Duke of Gloucester, clearly had taken on major roles as protectors in regards to Henry VI's minority as king. Why, therefore, would it be understood that Queen Elizabeth and the Woodvilles would be acting as regent or protector? The actions of Queen Elizabeth Woodville, attempting to bring Edward to London and have him crowned as quickly as possible, and possibly intentionally failing to notify Richard, is seen by many as the actual coup attempt. Richard, some argue, did not facilitate a coup, he prevented one. In fact, it is believed that on his route to meet up with Edward and his entourage in Northampton, he stopped in York and exacted oaths of fealty from the city magistrates for his nephew, indicating that he was still fully committed to his nephew becoming king at that point. It is also believed that Richard wrote consolation letters to Queen Elizabeth Woodville after the death of Edward's father and offered his fealty to Edward at that time as well. Additionally, some believe that the initial interaction between Edward's guardian at the time, Anthony Woodville, had been friendly. However, only after Richard's cousin, Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, arrived did the situation change, which saw Anthony Woodville arrested and sent north. If this is true, what the Duke of Buckingham may have added to the situation will most likely remain unknown, but his animosity towards the Woodvilles surely played a role. When the royal party arrived in London, Edward was not immediately taken to the tower. Instead, he was taken to the Bishop of London's palace. If Edward had been arrested by that time and was a prisoner of Richard's, would he have not been sent to the tower immediately? It is said that Richard III continued to extract oaths of fealty at this time, and preparations continued to be made for Edward's coronation, again showing that he was still committed to his nephew becoming king at that point. It is also argued that Richard did not officially assume the role of protector until after he arrived in London and had been chosen and appointed by the council. As far as Edward finally being moved to the tower, it is said that Henry Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, not Richard, suggested that Edward should be lodged in the tower, to which Richard accepted, not as a prison, but as a residence. It is believed that Richard was also said to have visited Edward in the tower to conduct business regularly, although he is not believed to have stayed there himself. After Bishop Stillington's revelation, it has been argued that Richard found himself in an unexpected situation, and he had to be persuaded to take the throne, and that he did so only after five days of said persuasion. Many believe that Richard found himself becoming king unexpectedly, and did not actively seek the throne for himself, although preventing a minority kingship was surely seen as a good thing to many in that time, and previous minority kingships had led to many problems in past reigns. With Edward's designation as being illegitimate, and with Richard having support from his family and the assembly that had been formed, some argue that Richard no longer had any logical reason to feel threatened by his nephews. In fact, in 1484, Parliament officially ratified the statute Titulus Regius, which solidified the unofficial assembly's decisions. Edward and his brother no longer had any claim to the throne, and Elizabeth Woodville's release of Richard of Shrewsbury to Richard's men some say is a sign that she may have been well aware of the legitimacy issue herself, and that she too felt that they would not be in danger. It is said that Richard actively pursued suitable marriages for Edward's now illegitimate sisters, and that he treated his other nephew, Edward Earl of Warwick, son of his executed elder brother George Duke of Clarence, with respect, and intended on prepping him for a role as a future Yorkist supporter. So why would his other nephews be any different? 
Now we must redirect our attention to after the boy's disappearance and discuss what some who consider Richard III innocent believe may have happened to the boys. After Richard began his tour of the realm after being crowned, the first murmurings of Edward and his brother's death began to circulate. This was around the time of Buckingham's rebellion, as discussed previously, and these rumors carried the implication that the boys had been put to death by Richard III. Some have argued that this was simply the spreading of a rumor that was intended to shift the focus from restoring Edward to the throne to supporting Henry Tudor, who was now beginning to push his claim. With that being said, many on both sides of the argument do accept that Edward specifically probably did die in 1483. How he would have died, however, is still obviously debated. Those who support Richard III tend to point to the fact that Edward very well could have died of natural causes around this time, and cite the point touched on previously that Edward may have been seen as a sickly child. In addition, Edward's physician, who visited him frequently, stated that Edward was making daily confessions and believed that he was close to death, as touched on previously. Although many have interpreted this as Edward was expecting to be executed by Richard III, some have argued that Edward was sick and that his comments were simply in relation to his declining health, not in relation to an impending execution. Additionally, the idea that Edward had generally been accepted as being dead by the end of 1483 is reinforced by the fact that in the future, imposters would come forward claiming to be the rightful heir to the throne, but none of them would claim to be Edward himself. They either stated that they were George, Duke of Clarence's son, the Earl of Warwick, or Edward's younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York. Although some believe that Edward may have died of natural causes during this time, it is also important to note that in the summer of 1483, it is believed that attempts were made at extracting the boys from the tower, as touched on previously. Some say it is not clear whether any of these attempts were successful, but there are some who consider that Edward and his brother may have been successfully taken from the tower and went on living after 1483. The last main points to touch on in regards to the defense of Richard III is in regards to Henry Tudor, who became Henry VII after Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field. Henry Tudor, after becoming king, found himself in a very interesting situation. Henry intended on marrying Edward's elder sister, Elizabeth of York, to add to his legitimacy, but in order for her royal status to be reinstated and for Richard III to be seen as a usurper, he had to remove the Act of 1484, which declared that she was illegitimate. Therefore, in his first parliament, he did just that. Henry ordered that the 1484 Act be repealed and that all copies be destroyed. This was to ensure that his new wife was now seen as a legitimate royal child of Edward IV, and any children they would have would be an undisputed claimant to the throne. However, in repealing this act, Henry also reinstated the royal legitimacy of Edward and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury. Therefore, if these boys were still alive, they would be the rightful heirs to the throne, not Henry Tudor. Thus, many conclude that it was not Richard III, who according to them had no legal reason to fear his nephews, that had the boys killed. Instead, it was Henry Tudor, whose kingship rested on the acceptance of the very idea that Edward and his brother were dead. Many also point to the fact that George, Duke of Clarence's son, Edward of Warwick, and one of the impostors discussed previously, were held in the Tower of London and were eventually executed by Henry Tudor, showing that although there may be no proof that Henry Tudor executed Edward and his brother, he was clearly not above executing young men with potential claims to the throne of England. In reality, Henry Tudor probably did not know what happened to Edward and his brother. Many in that time still believed that at least one of the boys were alive, hence the support for the imposters. These imposters were most likely one of the reasons that Henry Tudor put out the official stories of how Edward and his brother were killed, which stated that Richard III was responsible. This story was put out in 1502, 19 years after the alleged event took place in 1483. This is seen by many today as simply propaganda to hopefully eliminate support for any potential future imposters and to blacken the name of Richard III in the process. The accounts under the Tudor regime can certainly be seen as being successful in regards to blackening Richard's name, added to by the writings of William Shakespeare, who gave us the evil, twisted Richard III many recognize to this day. Lastly, the skeletons that were found in the tower have not been conclusively confirmed to have been Edward and his brother. Some have argued that the fact that animal bones were found with remains 
and that other young skeletons dating from Roman or pre-Roman times were unearthed in the tower as well, cast doubt that the skeletons are actually the princes. Sir Thomas More's account claimed that the boys were buried at the foot of a stair, but then subsequently moved. Therefore, some accuse those hostile of Richard of picking and choosing what parts of the account they use and don't use. Propaganda is definitely a powerful tool now, and surely was then, and many claim that the blackening of Richard's name is nothing more than an instance of this on a very effective level. Even if there is circumstantial evidence against Richard, many argue that there is also a significant amount of reasonable doubt, and therefore, Richard should not be easily condemned as a murderer of his nephews. The debate in relation to Edward V and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, Duke of York, remains very much alive to this day. Although compelling arguments have been presented over the centuries on both sides of the matter, disagreements persist through the current day. The discovery of Richard III's remains in 2012 under a car park shows that there is still always the possibility that new information can come to light. And I think those of us interested in this story hope that that will be the case and that someday the mysterious questions surrounding Edward can be conclusively answered. But as for now, mystery still surrounds the young king's life and death. The brief accounts relayed in this video are simply the tip of a massive iceberg and it is strongly suggested that anyone interested in this topic further explore the debate as there is quite an extensive array of information and arguments to be learned that could not be reasonably accounted for in this brief history. Regardless of what one may believe, we can all agree that whatever fate Edward may have met, it is certainly troubling to think that this young boy had little if no control of the events that took place, and this, unfortunately, is further evidence that life in that time was a difficult, dangerous, and ruthless experience to which even the most innocent of youth many times could not escape.